Brothers and guests, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker who will deliver the charge to this evening's candidates. Fellow brothers and honored guests, I am proud to introduce Brother Judge Terry Bullock, Kansas State 61. Judge Terry L. Bullock is a recently retired trial judge for the state of Kansas. He served that court of general jurisdiction for over 30 years, five as chief judge. He also served frequently by special appointment on both the Kansas Court of Appeals and the Kansas Supreme Court. He is perhaps best known for his constitutional decisions concerning the funding of the public education systems in Kansas. In his retirement, Judge Bullock continues to serve as a mediator in the settling of cases, a skill for which he is widely recognized. Before taking the bench, Judge Bullock practiced law for 12 years with a law firm in Topeka. Judge Bullock is an honor uh, graduate of both the University of Kansas Law School and Kansas State University. He served as the, an editor of the KU Law Review, was a member of the Order of the Coif, and taught legal ethics at both the University of Kansas and Washburn Law, Sco Law Schools for three decades. Judge Bullock has been honored by the local and state bar associations, receiving two lifetime professionalism awards and the Professional Courage Award, an award given only twice in the history of the bar and never before to a sitting judge. As an undergraduate at Kansas State University, Judge Bullock was elected president of the K-State Delta Epsilon chapter and, upon graduation, became the president of the chapter's alumni corporation. After graduation from law school, Judge Bullock was invited to become a member of the board of directors of the Delta Epsilon International Fraternity, on which he served for 20 years, the last five as president of the International Fraternity. Judge Bullock uh, is a 2001 recipient of the Distinguished DU Award, Delta Epsilon's highest honor. Please help me welcome Brother Bullock. Tonight, candidates, your own official individual stories in Delta Upsilon begin. This night, this bright and shining night, which you will never forget, brings mag magnificent opportunities to your lives. Opportunities which you cannot even imagine in your wildest dreams. Since you cannot look into the crystal balls, hello, I knew I had shock power. That's it. Okay, that's it. <clears throat> Since you can't look into the crystal ball of your futures, let me tell you a little bit about the opportunities Delta Upsilon brought to me, and in so doing, perhaps, give you a glimpse of what is to come for you. Here is my Delta Upsilon story. In 1957, when I was a freshman at K-State, I met a gentleman in an honors English class who invited me to the DU house for lunch. At that point in time, I had heard a lot about fraternities, and frankly, I didn't like much of what I'd heard. But DU didn't sound Greek to me, so what am I doing wrong? <laughs> Can you help me? Anyway, DU didn't sound Greek to me, so I accepted the invitation and went to lunch. When I got there, I found out that DU was indeed a fraternity, and so I said to the fellows, I probably should excuse myself because I really don't like fraternities. And much to my surprise, they said, we don't either. Welcome home. That's when I first began to learn there was something very different about Delta Upsilon. It was explained to me that far from being an ordinary fraternity, Delta Upsilon was actually founded in 1834 as a protest to fraternity. And all the excesses which they had, had made them unattractive to the men of the 1830s and frankly to me in the 1950s. The men in the chapter that I was visiting 
explained to me that they did not have and did not value secret grips and passwords and other false indicia of, of unearned status. In fact, they told me that the only superiority which Delta Upsilon recognized was the superiority of merit. In time, they taught me that this non-secret society was deeply committed to four fundamental principles. You know them, the advancement of justice, the promotion of friendship, the development of character, the diffusion of liberal culture. There was also a high commitment to scholarship and a total aversion to hazing. These values, which the chapter not only spoke about, but actually put into practice, matched my own. On that foundation of these shared values, lifelong friendships were formed, and I was initiated into Delta Upsilon. I came to my very first LI in 1958. It was held in East Lansing, Michigan. It was between my freshman and sophomore years of college. It's amazing how much I remember about that gathering. The most brilliant of those memories is a career seminar led by Chief Justice O'Neill of the Supreme Court of Ohio, Beverly Murphy, the first man I ever met who was named Beverly, <laughs> who just happened to be president of Campbell Suit Company, and Bertolt W. Antell, head of the nation's premier executive recruitment firm in New York City. If General Motors needed a president, Bert Antell would find them. These gentlemen, all DUs and all national leaders in their fields of business, law, and management, <clears throat> said over and over in various ways one significant thing. Their personal successes were in major part due to the opportunities to learn and develop that they had during their days in Delta Upsilon. The message was clear. We could do it too if we worked hard and believed in ourselves and in our values. We listened. When we came home from that conference, we were all fired up and our chapter decided that if we were to be competitive, we were gonna to have to build a big new chapter house on a scale to match that of the other successful fraternities at K-State. You see, while the fraternity system at K-State was old and well-established, our DU chapter was really fairly new, in fact, only two years old, having been installed in 1956. So we saved up $300 and we sent a delegation of three of our officers to the local savings and loan, and we indicated we'd like to borrow the money to build a new chapter house. The president of the savings and loan was polite and asked us what we intended to use for collateral. Well, we were in luck there because one of our guys was a business major and he knew what collateral meant. <laughs> <clears throat> And, and what we said was that we were going to give him a first mortgage on our new house. And he said, well, of course, but what else? He said, we can't loan 100% of value. And so our guys said, what else do you have in mind? And he said, well, if you had maybe $10,000 in the bank with no strings attached, maybe we'd talk. Now, I don't know what the present value of $10,000 from about 1958 is, but it's a lot. But our guys said, well, would you give us two weeks to put that together? And he smiled, I think, and said, of course. And so we went back to the house and had another chapter meeting and we all left and we went home and we talked to everybody we knew. And in one week we came back and we had raised $12,500. And we took it down to the savings and loan and we laid it on his desk. He leaned back in his chair and he shook his head and he said, there's no way in hell I ought to do this. <laughs> but he said, somehow I think if you guys can do that, you can do anything. 
Well, with that and with some help from the Michigan DU and the International Fraternity, we built the house. Succeeding alumni have improved it and enlarged it. And now it's home to over 100 brothers. It seems a bit humorous now, <clears throat> but when the house was first finished, we had to recruit some alumni from another chapter to start our alumni corporation because none of us were old enough to sign the papers. And all of the guys in the group that made this happen, all of them have said from time to time that this experience made all the difference in our lives. When the going got tough in years to come, all of us have reflected on those days and have thought, if we could do that, we can do anything. In the second semester of my sophomore year, our DU advisor and I had a long talk about my future. He eventually suggested that I had the qualities to become a good lawyer. To date, I had never actually considered that possibility. The next day, he took me up to the campus and introduced me to the pre-law advisor to explore that idea, and as it developed, my life, my life in the law began that day. In my senior year at K-State, I was elected chapter president. My other officers and I made an appointment with the university president, Dr. James A. McCain. We simply told him we'd been elected officers of the chapter and we wondered if he had any suggestions for us. He sat back in his big leather chair and he said, I don't know what kind of an answer you expected, but..." I've been sitting in this chair for 15 years waiting for somebody to ask that question. And then he told us about the colleges at Oxford and how the students there learn more in their residential colleges than they ever did in the classroom and how he had wished at the American universities we could have such a living and learning situation. And then it occurred to him we do have, we could have in our fraternity system. And that was when we began to, our new program of music and literature and art. One day we got a, ledger, a letter pledging books, music, art, and faculty resources. It was signed by the entire faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences. In the fall, a number of high school seniors showed up at our house. They were all valedictorians. They asked us if we would rush them. And we said, uh, okay. Um, where did you get this idea? And they said their faculty advisors had suggested it at pre-enrollment. Dr. McCain liked us so well, he became a DU, the president of our university. When it came time to go to law school, my father was ill and we were short of money. Dr. McCain arranged for me to have a scholarship. And out of the blue, the KU advisor at the University of Kansas, that's where the law school was, invited me to live free of charge in his home with him and his wife for my entire law school career. By the way, we had a cook and a maid, not a bad deal. And that simply put is how I became a lawyer. It was a DU who gave me the idea and it was DUs who gave me the means. When I graduated from law school, I went to Topeka, which is our capital, to interview with a large law firm. I was naturally nervous, but suddenly I realized this is just rush. I know how to do this from both sides of the table. I knew what they wanted to know and were afraid to ask, and I could tell them and make them comfortable. And so I got the job. And they made me what law firms call associates. But I knew I was really just a pledge <laughs> and I knew how good pledges succeed. They speak when spoken to. They come early and leave late. They make the coffee for the firm meeting and they work hard. They keep their eyes and ears open and their mouth shut. Of course, with my DU training, I was a good pledge. I mean associate. In three years' time, the partners invited me to the country club for a very formal dinner. 
I later learned they were looking me over to decide if they could offer me a partnership. Luckily, our DU house mother had schooled us well in the finer points of the etiquette of extra pieces of silverware and glasses, which I found at my place. She always said, learn the, your table etiquette so you can concentrate on the conversation and not on the forks. I must have done well at that dinner because they did indeed make me a partner, really just an active, in about one third the time it had been done before. Every Tuesday after I became a partner, I attended firm chapter meeting. I knew how to get things done in chapter meeting. I knew, for example, that you never bring anything up in chapter meeting until you know how it will turn out. I knew before introducing an idea that one meets individually with the members one-on-one -on -one, until eventually someone else brings up the idea in chapter meeting and all you have to do is say, what a great idea. I think I could support that. Couldn't the U.S. Congress use this training? I hadn't been in the law firm very long when the Chief Justice of Kansas sent for me. I was pretty nervous. My thir first thought was, oh God, did I maybe flunk the bar after all? But when I arrived at his chambers, the Chief offered me a cigar. Now, I don't smoke cigars, but I took one that day. <laughs> and when he handed me the cigar box, I saw his DU ring. He wanted to know how things were back at the K-State chapter. Turns out he'd been instrumental in its founding. <coughs> that encounter began a lifelong friendship, which culminated in one of the highest compliments ever paid me. At his death, the death of the Chief Justice, there was a great state funeral. The senators came from Washington, the governor, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, and the entire Supreme Court, of course, were all there, all serving as honorary pallbearers. Inexplicably, I and another young lawyer, Chuck Henson, were also asked to be honorary pallbearers along with those luminaries at the state funeral. Upon inquiry later, the chief's widow told me that the chief himself had planned his own funeral and that he insisted that Chuck and I be included with the dignitary because, as he put it, it'll do him good to be seen in that company. You see, Chuck was from the KUDU chapter, and I was from the K-State DU chapter, the two chapters in which the chief had always maintained an interest. Several years later, I was nominated for the court. The governor turned to his lawyer for advice on whom to appoint. By this time, guess who had become the governor's lawyer? Chuck Henson, he suggested me. During all my years on the court, over 30 at all, in all, I sized up the character of witnesses and parties alike with the skills I learned at DU, rush functions and chapter meetings when I was in college. In all my decisions, I sincerely tried to make justice come alive, just as we were taught to do as freshmen in the DU house so long ago. Music, literature, and art, have been linchpins of my great joy in living, and my life has been enriched beyond measure by the friendships which I have made, both in the chapter and throughout all of Delta Upsilon these past 53 years. I've also benefited enormously from the contributions of my DU brothers. My pledge father helped build the first space shuttle. My DU roommate, also in the space program, later helped develop the sonogram and the CAT scanner, both of which have been used to save my life. He also invented the machine that custom makes the glass insulating layer in every microchip ever made in the world. Another of my DU brothers became a cardiologist. He perfected a procedure which has reduced the death rate for hospital emergency room heart attacks by one-fourth in one year nationwide. This procedure has now saved the lives of two of my DU friends, one of whom is the twin brother of a man in this room today.
tonight. And so, my very dear brothers, on this bright and shining night, your own DU stories begin. In 53 years, one of you will be asked to give the charge at this initiation. What story will you tell? What accomplishments will you have to relate? How will you have seized the magnificent opportunities Delta Upsilon extends to you tonight? And the additional ones your DU brothers will extend to you in the years to come. And with their help, what opportunities will you have helped create? We can't wait to hear your stories of accomplishment and achievement. We know they will be grand indeed because we have prepared you well in our traditions. And when you have reached the pinnacles of your own success, be sure to pass our traditions on and our traditions of caring for each other to those brothers who will come after you. This is Delta Upsilon. This is who we are. Welcome 